This episode is sponsored by Me Undies. August is National Underwear Month, so from now till August 31st, you can get 20% off your first pair, plus free shipping by going to MeUndies.com slash labeled. That's MeUndies.com slash labeled. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Labeled, the podcast that shares the stories, rumors, and legends of Tooth & Nail Records. Today's episode focuses on the unlikely story of five rednecks who came from a very rural part of South Carolina and who had hardly been to a rock show until they were in their 20s, who got it in their heads that they wanted to start a band with screaming and singing back in 2001, and in spite of their lack of indie or punk background, found a way to become not just participants, but very influential in the screamo scene that was set to explode. And as you all know, two of the three hosts of this podcast happen to be in Emory. So we're handing the mic over to Aaron Lunsford to lead the way. Aaron is a total authority on all things Emory. In fact, he has written a book about Emory that you'll hear a little bit about later in the show. And before we get started, I have one quick question for you. Are you listening? Aaron hopped in the studio with Toby, Devin, and Matt to talk about how the band began. Hey guys, how y'all doing? Doing good. Rednecks right in the on. house. Living large. <laughs> okay, so obviously uh, everybody in this room is from the South. I'm originally from Atlanta. You guys are all from South Carolina. Uh, small towns like where y'all grew up, it's right outside Greenville, uh, mm-hmm. Greer, South Carolina. Right. And then Matt was even further into the boonies. Matt, and, and, Blue, yeah. Matt and Devin in Blue Ridge. Uh, so what's it like growing up somewhere like that? The easiest way to say where it is is it's tw- you know about 20 minutes to the nearest red light. That, <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. What, the way when we grew up, and I grew up on a dirt road, you know we had a convenience store that you could go to called A and A, and that's that was probably five, six minute drive to get you know candy bar or a mountain. Yeah, Dew. we always we always said we didn't go to town. We made a trip. To town. Yeah. <laughs> into town. You headed into town. Yeah, that was yeah, always the question I, I, at night. It'd be like, wait, you mean you're going to go back to town? Like, you know, you come home, <laughs> you, you had to have already stopped by the grocery store because otherwise you'd have to go back to town, is the way we'd say it. <laughs> yeah. Devin, what do you think about growing up in a small town in the South? Yeah, man, I loved it. I think it's it was super cool in the fact that um, it's, it's super rural and all that. And so you grow up with these communities that are – super close together, but also like there could be a, a half mile between you and the next house. You know what I mean? So you have these communities that are, that are pretty tight knit, but they're, they can be stretched out pretty far. But yeah, it's, it's weird now because I live like right in the heart, uh, you know, of a, of a downtown area of a, of a small town. And so, you know, uh, two minutes I could be anywhere I need to be, grocery store, restaurant, whatever. Back then, like Matt said, I mean, it took you 30 minutes to get anywhere, anywhere like worthwhile, you know, to get a drink, to get some some food or whatever. So, you know, things like that. But yeah, it's, I loved it. I think it was great. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So also the benefit there, um, Matt and Devin and Seth, they all, you all grew up together. Devin and I was playing baseball together when we were, you know, six years old. You know, he was a shortstop. I was a substitute outfielder. <laughs> But yeah, <laughs> substitute. It was a hot <laughs> shot shortstop. But yeah. yep, yep. I feel like when you're in a small town like that, you're obviously in a bubble. You don't really know what's going on right. anywhere except for there. But within that bubble, like, you know every damn thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know everything bubble, about you don't the know town. Any damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so what? Uh, I mean, what culture are you able even able to be exposed to? Especially back then, this is obviously this is like the '80s and '90s, the age we're at. So it's very little internet. You, I mean, you probably didn't have no, internet, did you? Eight, oh my no, gosh! Uh, I mean, it didn't even exist when I was a kid. I'm, I'm I'm older, but I mean, this is how my culture. I'm not kidding. The first Mexican food I ever had in my life, no joke, was Taco Bell, <laughs> and, and that is the truth. I, it, there was a new Taco Bell in town, and I can remember coming home. I worked at a snow cone factory. Uh, a snow factory. factory. A snow, I worked at a. Uh, I worked at a snow cone <laughs> hut, and uh, I can remember it was right. It was in the parking lot with a with a Taco Bell. I was like, I guess I'll try. It. I mean, I don't know. I thought it was something crazy. I was like, "What in the world is a taco? Why would you do that? You don't. You eat American food. That's what I thought back then." And I can remember coming home telling my dad, "I said I had Mexican food today." He said, "I will never eat Mexican food." <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking about Taco Bell. <laughs> he said, "I'm not going to eat that spicy stuff from another country." <laughs> <laughs> so that was my culture. I didn't know any better. I didn't know you could try things and it was safe and good. Were all your parents from towns like that or from 
that area. Yep. Oh yeah, I mean, totally. is this just a, it's a family thing? Yeah. Just this is how you are going to grow up here. Yeah, yeah. You, you grow up here and you don't leave. Yeah, my dad. I mean, he grew up. He he was born in a small town, North Carolina. Moved around a few times. Ended up in Blue Ridge, South Carolina. But I mean, he he told me stories about like he had fourteen brothers and sisters. They had, uh-huh. you know, like they could see the ground through their floor in their house growing up. You know, they were dirt. I mean, like dirt, dirt poor. Now, we figure that some of you probably have been to or maybe even live somewhere in the Deep South. But for those of you who haven't been there and don't live there, we thought it would be nice to help paint the picture for you by interviewing some of the key players in Emory's history, starting with... Uh, my name is Ronald Joe Shelton. I'm, I'm Devin Shelton's father. I'm Buddy Carter. I'm Matt Carter's father. Born and raised in South Carolina and big Clemson University Tiger fan. And last but not least, my in-laws, Tim and Marie Studley, Seth's parents. Hey, Dad. How's it going? It's going good. What are you doing? Well, I'm not doing nothing, but it's kind of crazy here. Well, hey. Hey, Mom. How are you? You're going to hear Ronnie, Buddy, Tim, and Marie sprinkled throughout the rest of the episode. And please forgive the low audio quality. These aren't the most tech-savvy of folks. But anyway, let's get back to the story. And so my dad grew up eating everything you can imagine. Like Toby was talking about, it's kind of the flip side of that. Like we were scared to try anything new, but at the same time we would eat every type of animal that you would kill outside. He, he would make squirrel, <laughs> squirrel, raccoon, rabbit. I mean, we had that on a monthly basis, no <laughs> doubt. So, so like that's, that's my world. The, the things that people now would never, tr- almost never try. That's yeah. the kind of stuff that my dad always would eat, but at the same time, we were scared to try Taco Bell because it was yeah. <laughs> it was Mexican food. <laughs> That's real interesting because that plays into a stereotype that you almost, even in my experience, I mean, I grew up in Atlanta in the suburbs, so I grew up in the South, but not like y'all did. Yeah. So eating uh, roadkill, that's essentially what Devin just said he oh, grew totally. up on. Oh, yeah. totally. You're, you're yeah. playing into a stereotype there that uh, reinforces... You know, well, just, yeah, they don't have nothing. They don't know nothing. Like We didn't have air conditioning until I was probably 14 or 15 years old. Yeah, we used to get school. We didn't have air conditioning at school when me and Devin were in first and second grade. And we got air conditioning oh in about third grade, and we would get school canceled if it got too hot. <laughs> 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 and it did get hot. It was the South. Yeah, it's not <laughs> Seattle or the West Coast. It's, it's South Carolina. It was hot in April. You had three months of school left. down yonder on the chat. It gets hotter than a hoochie coochie. We laid rubber on the Georgia asphalt. We got a little crazy, but we never got caught. Down by All right, you're growing up in this small town. Uh, Greenville is the closest thing that could even be considered a more than a town, yeah. I guess. Um, trying to relate a little bit. So when I was 12, uh, we moved from Atlanta to Little Rock, which I thought was like really bad. Little Rock actually ended up having a pretty good music scene. Uh, Because there were bands like Living Sacrifice, and there was a music producer there that had been recording some Tooth & Nail bands. So I went to my first show when I was 15. It was a a Goaty Hook show at Vino's Brew Pub, a really good venue. I am kind of, from talking to you guys uh, before, researching the book and stuff, there wasn't anything like that in Greenville, right? Well, now, within the decade that we came up, we did have, there was Hootie and the Blowfish, and Edwin McCain. <laughs> so if you want to call that a scene, yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah. I, well, I had asked, whenever I interviewed Seth for the book, I asked him, I was like, there's no bands from where you're from. Where were you even drawing any inspiration for our, you? I could be in a band. And he's like, Hootie. Hootie right. and the Blowfish. And that's like all he could come up with. So Yeah, I thought I thought touring was the college circuit or whatever and at best. Like you play college because Hootie, that's all they did. They played colleges forever. And there was a Frat scene parties, like yeah. that. Yeah, there was there was a bunch of those college rock bands and then Hootie caught on and then blew up. But that was what all it was. Dave Matthews, like you know, only way I found music was the radio. There was no underground scene. I didn't even know it existed. So, like in high school, you would have never thought, "Oh, we'll go to a show in Greenville." No. That wasn't no. a thought oh, in your mind. No, it, never, right? it never happened okay. not at all. Not even ever. Not at, at all. First time we ever went to a, what you would, you know, Green Day came when I was a senior in high school to the Memorial Auditorium. So, okay, I went to that. That's the first concert I ever went to. What what year that? That was ninety seven. I saw Green Day yeah. on their Insomniac tour at Greenville Memorial Auditorium, which was obviously a national tour and a C market. It wasn't a show. Yeah, of a scene. And that was the first time I'd seen a rock band play a concert in my life. The first time that I even thought about anybody other than like a professional musician, like Green Day or Weezer or Nirvana 
playing like even playing like an instrument in a band was we had a friend named Austin who was an incredible musician and he would play guitar at school and like he I mean it was really good and I was like what what is this I mean what is he trying to do like why like, would you was, just why yeah, what would was the, you do that yeah, yeah yeah like what was the point and then he got a few <laughs> guys together they they played music together I was like oh well, I guess that's cool but I don't understand they like, play the talent <laughs> show the talent? Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. maybe somebody played a talent show once or something. Yeah, stuff like that. So y'all didn't that. have that like was, a church. That was there it. wasn't like a, a church that did Friday night after the football game have a local band play. Well, anything like no. that. So we we got to doing into that kind of stuff. But I, I mean, this pretty. I'm pretty sure I'm right about this. We did a couple of fifth quarters where we would jam and play covers and songs that we were trying to write. Mm-hmm. Eventually, by the time we were graduating high school. And going to first year of college, we were doing stuff that you should be doing when you're 13. Um, but that's what we were. That's where we were. And so we played a Halloween party and a fifth quarter, and we played Radiohead song, you know, like Radiohead Creep and Weezer songs, and <laughs> tried to write some songs, and we would jam and do that. And as far as I know, we were the first band that had ever been at our high school in history. We, we yeah. were a band because we played together more than once, and we came up with a name. And as far as I know, that was the only and first band that our high school had ever had in its history. That was a good era, even for just getting into radio music. Yeah, like right. Nirvana. The radio and was right. good Foo there. In and all, all defense, stuff. the radio was good there. If you want to mark it, I, I think I figured this out yesterday. And radio was good, in my opinion, from the moment that Smells Like Teen Spirit came onto the radio until the moment that the uh, Down with the Sickness wah, ah, 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 came on the radio. Uh-huh. That is the end of the radio. <laughs> yeah. So between that time, it was actually pretty good. All my favorite bands in the 90s were Smashing Pumpkins mm-hmm. and. Nirvana, right. Bush, and so- Oasis, and stuff like that, and those are all big bands that everybody knew. When did when did you become aware of the idea that there were other bands that just weren't on the radio that would go play a venue somewhere? College, like yeah, I was probably twenty two, twenty three when I first realized there was music that you could play and do shows out off, outside of the radio. Yeah, like I did not know it existed. Uh, Matt, I think I had a quote from you uh, that uh, is in the book where you're talking about like it was like the first show that you'd gone to and you were super confused. Like people were hardcore dancing, you didn't understand. Right. Uh, like the, the only thing you, I think the thing you said, the only thing you'd ever thought was punk is green hair and mohawk. Yeah, I figured you have like a that. punk is you have a mohawk and you you're like a bad guy in a movie. And you do you play music and do drugs and beat up old people and you have a green mohawk. Yeah. That's that's what that to me. If somebody said punk, that's what I imagine they were talking about. I said, well, he's going crazy as a bed bug. <laughs> I said he got in that old head banging music. <laughs> head banging music, what you call it? Yeah. I said, what is all that screaming about? It was somewhat of a departure from what I call standard music. I didn't really understand it. What did you think of the music that we played? The music was hard. I mean, they were some like headbanging. I mean, that wasn't my style. Me personally, I just didn't really care about headbanging. We're just the boys and girls that think they always know. With this is for the world, the ambiguity shows. We're just the boys and girls that dance with all their clothes. I mean, I owe all my entire music uh, the taste to Joey Svensson, who we do a podcast with. Yeah. yeah. Podcast, because he's the first person that showed me music outside of the radio. Now, it was all tinged with Christian music. Like, that was kind of his thing. Like, he, he only really mostly, I'd say 95% was all Christian. So he was all into two yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was poor old yeah. blue yeah. and blank right. eye and he, whatever else. You were exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, those are the bands. Like, I, I remember the first time I really liked an independent band was Aaron Sprinkle, Rose Blossom Punch, his, his al- album. I was like, whoa, this sounds kind of like the radio. <laughs> That's how I judged it. That's how I judged any music. If it, if it was kind of like the radio, I was like, this isn't too bad. I didn't know. And then the, fir- the first time I heard screaming in music, not joking, was Pedro the Lion, the Holy P, and, as the third song on the Holy P, almost there. And, and I just, I mean, that that's the first time I heard screaming. Almost there. So 
once I heard that, I started realizing that was the thing that happened with me is I was always a good singer. So, so everybody, I got solos in choir, you know, Devin and I both were in the music program at our college at Winthrop University. And we thought, yeah, you're supposed to sing in a proper style and show people how to sing well and in a way that uh, resembles choral music. And so when I started hearing people sing like what I thought at the time poorly, I couldn't understand it. I was like, why in the world would somebody not sing just perfectly? And how, <laughs> how would anybody listen to it if they're not singing perfectly? And then I realized, wait a minute, they're just being themselves and it's part of it. And so that's when I started realizing, wait a minute, maybe you can do anything with music. You can do whatever so, you want. That was a distinct feeling yeah. that I had. Let me just add one more thing to the time period, yeah. too. Like, we just, I guess it might have been right along the time when you realize, wait, you can do whatever you want with guitars and drums and bass and your voice. And it's kind of this awakening being in that college age where you're like, wait a second, you can do whatever you want as a person. Like, you can. Like, if you. Like you can do stuff. It's not there's not these pre-worn paths of you have to do vinyl siding now or take over your dad's business or whatever it is. You can play mm-hmm. music. You, like this is real. Like the internet had just come on. It was just the right time where we had moved, you know, ninety miles away to go to college, hanging out, and you just like we just kind of came online. In fact, we started skateboarding in our early twenties. Toby and I bought yeah. skateboards at, at the toy <laughs> store right. that cost twenty dollars, and the first concerts we were ever going to, we'd take these twenty dollars skateboards that we had, and we were trying to learn how to ollie outside, the, you know, and we do it on the balcony of our college apartments and stuff like ollie. Oh, crazy! Yeah. And you know, we're trying to like wear pads and figure out how to not get hurt doing it. We're twenty something years old trying to learn how to kick flip and ollie and stuff like that. So. I mean, I remember the first time when I thought, wait a minute, other places like counties and towns outside of South Carolina would build skate parks for people. Like, I was like, what? In the, when we moved to Seattle, I was like, are you kidding me? They pay for a skate park for somebody? We, we were doing it in, you know, parking garages and all this stuff. We didn't even know what we were doing. And everybody else had, like, it felt like everywhere outside of the South cared about culture and it letting you experience life the south was like no this is all you need you don't need sidewalks what are you gonna where are you walking to yeah. you know, <laughs> i never had a sidewalk until i moved to seattle you just had like the gravel on the yeah, side yeah. of the thing and, I, mean, I never yeah. walked on a sidewalk literally until i moved to seattle <laughs> Hey you guys, it's Matt, and I wanted to tell you that this is a huge milestone for the Labeled Podcast. When we started this podcast, we didn't know if it'd be successful, if people would like it, how many people would like it. We didn't know, we didn't know what it would be, but it turns out to have overwhelming support. The numbers are huge, so much so that this podcast is able to have sponsors. And what that means is we're going to bring you some outside sponsors that makes products that we think are good and share them with you. And if you like this podcast, it would mean the world to it and it's long-term existence if you supported these products if they sound good to you. So the one I'm going to tell you about right now is one called Me Undies, and it's a company that I truly love and have been wearing their underwear for a long time, for a couple of years now. So think about it this way. If you want to look good in your underwear and be comfortable, then Me Undies is the perfect balance because that's that's hard to find. You don't want to sacrifice style or comfort. So I'd like for you to check out Me Undies. Now, August is National Underwear Month, and to celebrate that, Me Undies is making it easier than ever to try the world's most comfortable underwear by giving you a risk free guarantee. All National Underwear Month long, if you don't love your Me Undies, they're free. That means you Get your money back and keep the underwear so there's nothing to, to risk there. And here's why you have to check them out. This is the single reason why I think it's a no-brainer. MeUndies are made from lensing micromodal, which is a sustainably sourced, naturally soft fabric that's proven to be three times softer than cotton, which is probably what you're wearing right now. So just imagine if your underwear was three times softer than they are right now. The uh, micromodal fabric is also all-natural, breathable, eco-friendly fabric, and it's extruded from Austrian beech trees, if you want to know technically where it comes from. And that natural fabric automatically inhibits odor. So no more stinky undies, just soft cool and cozy me undies for the rest of the summer so and remember all national underwear month long you can try them yourself risk free it's simple if you don't love your me undies they're free so from now until august 31st get 20 percent off your first pair plus free shipping at me undies.com slash labeled that's me undies.com slash labeled one more time me undies.com slash labeled Tell me we can do this. Three for three, I'll 
But all you guys had the aspiration to kind of get out. You went to college. So, I don't know right? if that was aspiration yeah. to get out, though. We didn't have any plan at all. College was an incubator where I spent four years not working, worrying about college work because it just was dumb, and but having tons yeah. of free time to learn how to do what I wanted to do. I mean, that, you know, that's the way it felt to me. Like I didn't have any. I did not have a plan whatsoever. Or an I didn't care either. at all. Like, like I, I actually got my senior. Like, I was always a really good Christian kid. Like my freshman year of high school, never missed a day of school. I was like a nerd, made good, good grades and all this stuff. And then I started realizing it did, it didn't make me cool. And nobody that was cool liked me because of those things. And so I flipped a switch and and became like the you know pothead uh, party guy. Yeah. Completely, and so I failed my senior year. <laughs> I didn't graduate with my senior class. I had to graduate in summer school. Uh, luckily, I, like I failed my senior year of high school, I failed four classes. Good I should have had to repeat. I talked three of the teachers into passing me, and my algebra two teacher, I could not talk her into it. So me going to college was a complete accident. I went and visited a friend, and he said, hey, I bet you could get into this college. I was like, <laughs> oh, no way, dude. And he was like, yeah, just try. And I did. <laughs> I don't know why they let me in, Charleston Southern University, but they just let me in. So going to college literally was just like a goof. It was like, well, what, what am I going to do? Yeah. Stay in Greer? Why I don't I go to Charleston and yeah, party? I, I was studying music, and I just thought of it as four more years before life gets awful. Like I, I get four more years <laughs> to be a, a, yeah. not an adult, basically. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I mean, I was I was the first and only person in my family that went to college. So I mean, literally, like my dad didn't finish school, my mom didn't finish school. They didn't have the money to, and so I yeah. was the, I was like. You know, literally like the golden child because I went to college and we called him the golden boy. In other words, his phone number is top of my favorites. And and you mean your parents didn't finish high school, right, Devin? Your parents didn't finish. Yeah, high they school. didn't finish high school. My dad, I think my dad made it to eighth grade. Then he had to work. Yeah, yeah. He just had to work all all day every day. And plus, he hated it. He got in fights like every day. But my my mom, yeah, she was super smart and she just kept. I mean, but she they just didn't have the money. So anyway, I went to college as the first one. And, and I mean, it's not because my family's not, not intelligent at all. It's just because it wasn't really pushed that way. It was like, oh yeah, well, you can either go straight to work and make money or you can go to college and I guess try and figure out what you want to do after that. That was yeah, kind of I the think, options. I, I wonder if like in the 90s is, is when that really, I don't really have the research or data, but it seems like going to college as a kind of just something you did. Right. That became really po- everyone. Right. Just- America decided, hey, this is really important, but they screwed everybody because right. they didn't figure out a way to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, so we all still <laughs> yeah. are well, kind. They, of- they started letting you in, right? Yeah, they, right. No, I just exactly showed right. up. I failed high school, and they said, "Yeah, come on, man." They take your money. <laughs> Those aren't good people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's converging paths here. Uh, so Matt and Devin and Seth, uh, the original Emory drummer, they all grew up like together, knowing each other. You guys didn't really know Toby. Right, uh, and so when y'all all went off to college, Matt went to Clemson. Devin, you went to Winthrop immediately. Yeah, and yep. you were at College of Charleston. Yep. and you met I went, Joey. I went to Charleston. No, I went. Oh. To, yeah, I went to Charleston Southern. Charleston first, Southern. Yeah, and then followed a girlfriend to Winthrop. Okay, and then and then uh, and that's where yep. it all. And Matt yep. left Clemson, so that y'all kind of yep. came back together at Winthrop. Matt followed a girl to Winthrop as well. She wasn't my Devin girlfriend, but uh, I followed her there yep. nonetheless. <laughs> right. Uh, so everything kind of converged, and there were two different bands. You and Joey had a band. Joe Seven Forty Seven. Yep. And Matt and Devin and Seth had a band. That was simply Wayne's, and yeah. then they changed to Satchel later. Yeah. But how did you and these guys, even though you grew up in the same town, obviously now now it's the begin- this is kind of where the lifelong relationship, professional and friendship starts for y'all. So I always say this. So uh, this is really funny. First time that I saw Devin and Matt, like I saw them separately. I saw Devin walking across campus one time, and Devin had long hair about down to his shoulders. And I can remember him walking by. And so I'm, I'm older than Devin. He was a year or two younger than me. But I can remember <laughs> seeing Devin walk across the campus, and I went, 
that guy is just a jerk. Look, he thinks he's so <laughs> cool with his long hair, and he's just the new guy on campus, and he thinks he's awesome. And then we ended up in cor- uh, in the chorus class together, and then uh, we kind of became friends, and I was like, oh, maybe this, maybe I was wrong. And then Okay, so then Devin said, hey, why don't you come over to my apartment? Some buddies are going to be there, and we're going to play like a home run derby yeah. in, our, you know, in, our, in our courtyard or whatever. So I was like, okay, sure. So I went over, uh, and there was this tall, lanky guy. And Devin said, hey, this is Matt. And I was like, I'll never like that guy. That guy is just a <laughs> jerk. He he is just annoying. His voice is it, southern and nasal. It just bothered me. And then, of course, both of them became like some of my best friends ever. And so we all started just somehow, we all were musicians. Like everybody was in the music program at that time. I changed eventually to elementary education because I was doing so bad at just <laughs> trying to do music. And so we all we all changed a little bit, and I uh, we just started playing. You know, Matt and Devin had a like a little bit of a practice space in their apartment. They'd play during the daytime. And I get to go over there, and everybody kind of had ideas about music, but nobody knew what we could do. Like, we just didn't even understand, oh, we can really write music or anything. We just thought, well, it's fun to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's how it really started. It's fun to write music. It, so much so that we even did competitions. Like, we didn't know what we were doing, so we did song write-offs where we, like, we, we'd pit one person against another, and you'd have to perform your song, and then you would get votes until eventually one person won. I don't remember who won, but we we just did silly stuff with music just for fun because yeah. it was a hobby. There was We never thought at that time, when you were in college, there is no thought in our brains that we could become professional musicians. Even if we thought we were good enough, I didn't really think, yeah, I'll be doing this for a living. So there was never a conversation of like, hey, we should uh, maybe we should drop out of college. No, we didn't even have... We didn't be even a band. Know, hey. We weren't even doing shows i mean we would play for fun like we were just exploring music itself like it wasn't like yeah. it is now there wasn't a scene even in college when we're in college it's still there weren't bands in a scene doing shows we, there wasn't yeah. local but we weren't trying to even be a local band we were just people that fooled right. around with music the other thing that was different about you guys compared to a, a lot of other bands, you all did go to college. You all finished college. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that was like something you all just did. A lot of bands, like, I mean, think of like Under Oath or something. A lot of those guys only went to high school. Yeah. And were, had started doing Under Oath full time the summer after they graduated. Yeah. High they are not as smart as the guys in Emory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Emory, Emory is just a band of academics. <laughs> that's, that's what we've always been known for, yeah. our academic status. I mean, don't you think like the difference is like we didn't actually have the idea to do that until right. we were halfway to three quarters of the way through yeah, our right. our college degree. So and yeah. these guys ha- have this experience and stuff when they're 14, 15, 16 years old yeah. that we didn't have. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I can't say that we wouldn't have made the same decision given we had the opportunity and the experience when we the were exposure younger. too, you weren't even exposed right. yeah. to the idea. Right, exactly. So. Yeah, and nobody thought it was good or cool to be in a band. Like playing music and stuff like that was like a hobby. That was all it could be. Nobody actually thought you could earn a living or do anything. So pursuing it was kind of silly. But yeah. you did decide to pursue it, though. Yes. Emory forms. It's called Emory. By the time you're out of college, right? Yes. Are you calling it that? Okay. Yeah. So you you start having conversations. You're almost done with school. Uh, there's something about a Mexican restaurant and a meeting that you guys had. T- tell me about that. Yeah, so Joey Joey had this idea. Uh, we were in Joe 747 at the time, and he had this idea that he had already graduated. He was a, a full-time teacher at this time, but he was set on maybe we could actually make it. Now, this is the guy that introduced us to music, so he actually – really knew about other music outside of us and always believed that we were talented enough. He didn't think it, he wasn't that talented (laughs) musically. He was a terrible bass player, but he believed that like us, like me and Matt and Devin could actually really do something and really believed in us so much so that he decided, he came to me and said, 
what if we pursued a band after you graduate, Toby? Because I, I, I still had like a year or whatever, or another semester or whatever left. So he came to me and we talked about it. And I was like, yeah, I'll do this. I don't care. I don't want to be a teacher. I'll get my degree and everything. And if, if it doesn't work out, I'll do that one day. So he talked to me about it. And I was fully on board. And so we decided to talk to Devin and Matt because we thought they were the best musicians and the best people that would be willing to maybe even try it. So we we didn't think we didn't want to hurt anybody else's feelings because they were in a you know their other band and uh, those other guys. We didn't want to hurt their feelings. So we called up Devin and Matt and said, Hey, listen, <laughs> we came up with the worst lie ever. We said, Hey, we want to join a softball league. Meet us at the Mexican <laughs> restaurant. We'll talk to you about it. And because that way they wouldn't talk to anybody else about being in a band and possibly moving. When they get to the Mexican restaurant, and we went there just recently, actually, uh, while we were on tour, it was pretty fun. But uh, so we sat them down and we said, hey, would you guys be open to when you graduate, let's move, let's go somewhere. And, and would you want to do it? And I was unbelievably blown away. Both Devin and Matt said, yes, we will. Like it, it was immediately that they said yes. And so from that point on, we decided where can we move? We, I mean, we made a big list of like Boston or uh, Lawrence, Kansas, where some bands were from and, yeah. or California, all the stuff. Ended up deciding on Seattle because it was the farthest away and we loved, you know, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, all that stuff. We thought it'd be really cool to go to Seattle and try it. And so that's how we ended up going there. Well, yeah. Matt and Devin, so whenever they came to you with the proposition, uh, you say that it's not something you've really considered before. Like, what made you think, oh, yeah, sure, it why was, not? It like, was so clear. It was so clear. It's something that I would have never considered ever before that. It would have never crossed my mind to do that. And the instant the question came out of their mouth, the answer was 100% yes. Like, yeah, of, that, of course I'll do that. The second I heard the question, yeah. it was just a 100% yes. As, as, as if everything had been leading up to that. Just mentally, just the fact that you could do stuff, that things were possible. I was never scared of anything. I've always felt free, but the hardest thing to ever do is know what you want to do. I mean, it's not as hard to do something as to know specifically what it is you want to do. And when I heard the idea, I was like, here we go. That's it. I've been waiting for an idea my whole life. Finally, somebody had one. Let's do it. Did you believe it that we were when we told you we were going to move to Seattle? Did you believe we'd even go? Hey, the truth, I cried. You cried when you heard that we were moving to Seattle? Yeah, I said I'm a son of a gun. He gets out of college, don't get to see him for two or three or four years, then he moves as far away from us as he can. I said he must hate us. <laughs> I do remember you, you guys trying to remodel a trailer that that I gave you and you were in there building bunk beds out of two by fours in that trailer and I'm thinking they're going to smother in there or burn up. I sort of had mixed feelings about it. but Do you remember when I told you that we were going to go? Did you even believe that we would go? Well, yeah, I thought you'd, I thought you'd go. I just thought it was just a phase, and you'd get through it, and then you'd come home and, and live here happily ever after. <laughs> We walked out of that Mexican restaurant, and it was like it was just like so exciting. It's like, yeah, this is great. And but we're yeah. you know we're goofy and crazy and wild people anyway. So we all walk out of there and go back and start telling people, and everybody's like, <laughs> yeah, right. I went and told my girlfriend, yeah, y'all are like, stupid. Yeah, I was so excited. I was like, listen, this might be crazy. I know because we're dating, whatever. But here's what we're gonna do. She laughed. You know, yeah. I told my dad, he's like, I don't think so. <laughs> so somebody yeah, yeah. Yeah, I told out, my whatever. dad, and he said, Don't call me when you fail. <laughs> That's what my dad said to my face. <laughs> it, it just sounded like us going on with some new kooky idea. But I mean, it wasn't, we knew it wasn't. But, and, and part of you doubted, you're like, Huh, is my dad right? I guess somebody will back out and it'll just fall apart, probably. That's what my dad thought. I mean, he wasn't even trying to be mean or deflating, even. It just, it sounded like yeah. it just went some other kooky idea. Well, I, whenever I moved to Louisiana to join Ad City's Burn, I told my parents, hey, I'm moving to Louisiana. We're going to go on tour. And my mom said, what do you mean? She said, well, right. what do you mean you're going to go on tour? And I was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, we're going to play shows. She's like, where? 
Right. Like, at places <laughs> that have shows. <laughs> and I, she grew up in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And so it, maybe it is that Southern thing. Like, you don't think you can just go out and yeah. live somewhere else yeah. or drive to California and play a show for people. Exactly. Well, people now right. don't understand. Like, now you can record a whole, a whole album in your garage. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what I mean? Now you can you can book shows and do all this stuff. Like, at the time, everybody thought, this is silly. Like, the only... I mean... Nobody knew. How, my parents didn't understand that you could make music and get signed, and it not be on the radio and make a living. Yeah, you know that that didn't make any sense to them. So of course it was a bad decision. You have your degree in elementary education. Yeah, why wouldn't you use that for them? For, for it to make sense to them, it have to be like, hey, this big shop from L.A. called us and given us a million dollars. Right, exactly. Right. And we're gonna be exactly. on the radio. I heard the demo. Going, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going on tour with. Uh, whoever yes that know, that's right something. that that has always been the traditional fantasy of it, just a girl who sings at church and knows her voice is good that one day the producer is going to call and give her an arena show and a record contract because she's that good at yeah. singing like that's that's yeah. all that, that's the only thing that could make sense uh, it, you know yeah if we would have told our our parents we were starting a cover band playing songs that had been written they would have understood it more than you're going to write your own music yeah, yeah but that's not that doesn't even compare at all to what yeah. what the reaction was to the notion that the music that we did do was both original and contained uh, hollering yeah <laughs> <Hey>, right <Ryan. laughs> that's the part that really didn't make sense to anybody including the, including uh, young people yeah. at the time by the way including college age girls and guys were all yeah. still did not understand in a million years why you would make those sounds yeah. yeah, I mean, we we, we did uh, <laughs> Joe Seven Forty Seven and uh, Simply Wayne's. We started playing like bars in Rock Hill and, and and our surrounding area, I guess. But we were our only fans. Yeah. Nobody <laughs> understood who or what we were trying to do. Like it was silly. Like if you're gonna be a band, why wouldn't you do something like jazz or why wouldn't you do yeah, something like a cover band? Doing. Why would you try to do originals? Y'all are, who do you think you are? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'd mix in originals and then we'd play, you know, Rage Against the Machine at the end so the frat, so if we could get a few frat guys to listen or something. That's really all <laughs> yeah. it was. Right. No, I, okay. I still get that question all the time. Like, now, did you guys write all the songs on this album? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I still get that, like, all the time from people. Decided to move to Seattle and just made the decision in about 20 minutes. Uh, we said, okay, everybody save up $300 and we'll leave at the end of summer. That's, yep. You you thought $300 each? That's what each. we did. Each. That's what yeah. we did. And we'd check that's in. We you got 300 <laughs> saved up yet? And that's what we did. Everybody said, right, sounds... we, we graduated college, said go go home to wherever you are, go work hard this summer. And everybody said uh-huh. $300 and we'll leave in September. Okay, so going to Seattle though, Tooth and Nail had nothing to do with that. No, really. No, we we actually thought we won't sign a Tooth and Nail. They're a Christian label. We don't know if we want to do that. All this stuff. We thought that it would just not be right for us, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so many people have always thought that, yeah, oh, they moved to Seattle because because of Tooth and Nail. Or because we got it's signed. Or connecting the dots, right? Like, yeah, connecting yeah. the dots. It makes sense. But we never thought we'd sign a Tooth and Nail. And then um, after we recorded our our first album, we recorded it on our own. We live basically. We we call it the compound, but it was like a one bedroom house uh, where we all lived together and it had like two garages in the back, and so all of us lived together. And then we saved up money. We would put seventy five percent of our paychecks, each of our paychecks, into an account, kind of, and then keep twenty five percent for ourselves. That was the idea. It kind of worked, and uh, and then we decided to save up and record with Ed Rose in Lawrence, Kansas. We recorded our own album, got that made, and then shopped it around, sent it out. Yeah. We sent packages, you know, snail mail out to all these different labels. And then John Dunn. We didn't even send one to Tooth and Nail. Yeah, yeah. We didn't even send one to Tooth and Nail. We didn't even, we just didn't think we wanted to be with Tooth and Nail. Wow. John Dunn said, Hey, would y'all mind if I 
gave this record to Tooth and Nail and just just to see. Yeah. And sure enough, they liked us. We played in their basement. They had a basement at the time. Played in their basement, and they offered us the best deal, and it really was the best deal. Like they were that. Uh, uh, generous, kind, gave us a great deal compared to uh, some of the other offers we had on the table, and so that's why we ended up signing Tooth and Nail. So, uh, John Dunn and Brandon have both talked about this, and you know, people may have even heard this story. But so, you guys kind of you got up there, you figured out how to write uh, write the music you wanted to write. Like y'all wrote Wheat's End mm-hmm. and recorded it before you were ever on Tooth and Nail. Um, but like, it sounds like y'all didn't quite have your like image figured out or yeah. something like that yeah you still you still kind of had a small town m- mentality uh we all wore, yeah we all wore no yeah we all wore super baggy clothes carhartt <laughs> pants i mean we, we didn't understand that you needed to look a certain way now we were worried about how rumor. we sounded we didn't i didn't cross yeah. my mind how we looked i didn't think right. we were making and, visual art it didn't cross my mind yeah anyway. it just but i, I will say this that, that, <laughs> There's been a rumor that has gone around that like we like tooth and nail forced us to lose weight, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. shape, and and wear all these cool clothes. That was totally not true. That is totally not true. They did not tell us anything. In fact, all, all that happened was it, this is really funny. I can remember going Joel and I, Joel, our bass player, and I were are were overweight. Sometimes I still am. I, I fluctuate. <laughs> I'm yo-yo dieter. And I said, you know what, Joel, We're, we are going to be playing shows in the future. Let's uh, try this diet that Matt's mom told us about. <laughs> Matt, your mom mm-hmm. mentioned something called low-carb diet, Atkins diet yeah. at the time. That was the big thing. And so I said, Joel, let's just try it. We won't work out. We won't do anything. But what if we happen to lose some weight? We'll look better on stage. You yeah. know what I mean? And so we ended up doing that. And then from there, I think Matt and maybe John Dunn bought some clothes, and we started buying into this idea that, hey – you can look better on stage, and it it will present better. Yeah. So maybe a little bit of that, but for the most part, we just thought everything with Emory. We want our music to be really good. We love what we're doing, so why not present it in the best way? But that was our decision. Yeah. Tooth yeah. and Nail never forced well, us or made us look a certain way. The rumor is, the rumor would be that they made us look good and lose weight to get signed or whatever. But the reality is. They were aware of us, and the signing thing wasn't instant. They knew who we were and liked it. Probably was a six-month period before from mm-hmm. when they showed interest and we got signed, during right. which time we lost weight. So there is a real sense in which they saw us be one way, and then once we lost weight, started looking good and doing everything, that's when they're like, okay, these guys are the real deal. So at this point, you guys have to be thinking, we grew up in a small town, we moved to Seattle, and now we're getting a record deal? This is working? I, I know you had confidence enough to move there, and you knew that your music was good, and you had the record and everything, but were you a little bit surprised? or? I don't know if we ever really doubted that it was mm-hmm. going to happen. I mean, we weren't, we weren't absolutely certain of our success or how much success we would have, but I think we were pretty confident in our songs yeah. and our music, and everything that we were like, man, something's going to happen. It's just yeah. a matter of time. And so when we did start get, getting interest and then and eventually signed to Tooth & Nail, even though we were super happy, I mean, we were super excited beyond what I could probably describe. I mean, still, we were. I think it was an expectation that we had. So yeah. we were just like, well, let's, once we're signed, now that we've done it, let's keep going. Let's grow this thing because yeah. we, just, we just had these, these expectations of ourselves and confidence to okay. do it. It was like, all right, well, here we go. Let's go. What, to what Devin's saying, at this point, if you trace it all the way back, you're not in a band the way we grew up unless you were huge, famous, and playing arenas, or you weren't a band. Yep. Now, we'd spent the next five years from college and moving to Seattle and doing this thing, recognizing how effective things can be 
and how real they can be, but also can be very, very, very small. So we'd run into these punk rockers and these DIY bands, and finally it gotten all the way down to where there was people doing creative things and art that they wanted to do, still with virtually no success, yet they were doing it. So as to what Devin's saying, we were confident that we could do something. Now, we weren't yeah. thinking we were going to be an arena band or a big band or ever earn $1,000 to play or ever play for more than 100 people. None of those things yeah. we were thinking. However, we knew there's stuff you can do for 50 people and sell three shirts and go to the next city and 30 people can show up. We'd seen that now, and we knew that was achievable. Yeah. And we knew that yeah. you can be on a tiny little dinky label and get a record put out. We knew that was possible, and we knew that was going to happen at some point. But that's, that's as far as we thought about that, that we would be in that real world where you can drive to a, a new town, and somebody could have heard of you because of mp3.com, and you could play for 30 people, and maybe you could get another gig, and maybe you could get a record put out by some label in some way. That was, yeah. that was what we were confident could happen, and that's, uh, that's as far well, as we thought. Well, so we skip ahead, and... The question, how many units did it sell? 180, 190,000? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's over 200,000. Over 200,000 records. That's pretty insane. I mean, that's one of the biggest records of in tooth and nail history, maybe in the top 10 or 15, right? I don't know. Gotta be. I mean, it's a big deal. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to communicate and articulate here because uh, people that aren't in the music business, they don't always really, they hear, oh, Lady Gaga sold a million records. But right. selling 200,000 records is an insane amount of records to sell, uh, not even just for a, a big band, like a major label band. Yeah. Like, right. You know, for anybody, that's great, which means you can go out and play shows where 1,000, 1,500 people are going to be there, mm-hmm. which means you can go out and support bands that can draw 3,000 people. Mm-hmm. And so, so you guys, like, made it to the top. You know, in a lot of ways. Yeah, it was, and, but uh, it was way beyond what we were thinking. Like, I, I, right. I, I'm still feel like it's this way. I don't. You don't need, or we don't ever have far off goals. It's just what do you want to do today to tomorrow, and do and keep on doing that, and eventually you get somewhere. And one day we played a show for a crowd, and we, you know, when we were signed, it was on the Tooth and Nail tour. We played our first show as a signed band on tour with a record out. And it was yeah. night and day from anything we'd ever done before. We'd earned hundreds of dollars before, gotten paid a hundred or sold two hundred dollars in T-shirts, and we went down and played the show for a room full of people that were singing our lyrics in Florida, which was like just crazy, the weirdest thing ever. And it was hundreds of people. And then we yeah. sold. We Devin did the merch and came back to the van. And we said, "How do we do a merch?" And Devin was laughing. He just was laughing, <laughs> and he and he couldn't really say it with a straight face. He said, "We sold a thousand dollars in <laughs> merch, and we just all died laughing for, for an yeah. hour." I mean, that it just didn't yeah. even make sense, you know. So we never had. It wasn't like one day we'll make up. We this, that number never even crossed my mind as a possibility, even after we were signed. It just didn't make. It just didn't think that far. It's like a pencil with the races at both ends. I want it all, but we're dealing in process. And these activities that you have engaged in, this is the politics of seeing you dance with him. We began with concluding remarks. Break up the pieces and examine the parts. Your words always cut when they're cliche But here's my not because I came for the buffet This is the way it goes when you are part of it Nervously saying words, fiddle the plastic bed A mark beneath the chin I've caught you once again After Devin said it, we all died laughing, we couldn't believe it We thought it was hysterical that you could make a thousand dollars selling t-shirts, right? <laughs> I, remember, I remember saying I will do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, if you can make $1,000 a day for your band, yeah. well, of course you'll do this till you're yeah. 65 years old. Well, I guess I thought real specifically on that. I thought, well, there, this, I, I guess it was this. The first impulse was, this is an anomaly. We didn't know that was going to be the new normal. Um, so I thought, right. well, wait till tomorrow. I mean, this is, that was just funny that this happened this one time or something. But short of that, it was like, if this were true, if this were to happen every night, well, I suppose we'd never have any money problems ever again. That's enough money right. for it. That's just plenty of money, at least. <laughs> that won't be a problem. Yeah. Right. Just to give you another sneak peek inside to how Emory worked kind of a little bit, is we so we started kind of doing these merch numbers pretty consistently. 
things were getting better. We still weren't getting paid much per show, like guarantee wise, a couple hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. But we we're making a lot in merch because we had some fans. And so er, here's what happened. So er, I would keep the cash. I was like the accountant, you know, in the van. And so we did that probably I would say three to six months. We would accrue all this cash. I would set aside to pay off our merch to get new merch. And then at the end of every week, we would do this this payday. So we, I would pay out cash at the end of every single week on tour. And like I said, this was like almost, probably six months in a row. And we would play this like Mexican party song. <laughs> it was like, and we called it the payday song. And I would pass out this money every week. We did this, like I said, four to six months. And we'd yell as <laughs> we you handed be, it. Yeah, we'd so to yell happy. party and play the payday song. We would song. be so happy. You won't believe it, the, the joy that came from us every Friday when, I, when we did that. It was just the best. <laughs> Uh, Toby, did your dad ever grasp, or does he grasp? Is he proud? Does he understand what selling a hundred or a two hundred thousand records even means? No, my dad has never gone to a store and bought our record or anything. But <laughs> I will say this: when my dad, this is a true story. When my dad realized that we had done it, here is the the clue or the the thing that happened that that revealed to him that maybe his son had had some success. Our song, uh, the uh, studying politics, got on it. It got on the commercial for the TV show Prison Break, <laughs> and so my dad liked that show, and so he saw a commercial on TV where our song he heard me singing, and it, and I I told him I was like, yeah, hey, actually we're gonna be on Prison Break. Prison Break. <laughs> and it was like silence of the moment. <laughs> Which they've come back out. They haven't contacted us. I hope that they still, maybe they'll contact us. You know, there's a new season for Prison Break. Yeah. But that my dad thought, wait a minute. If Toby's music gets on a commercial for Prison Break, then it might actually be real. You know what I mean? Because he never heard it on the radio. He didn't. He didn't understand that. Or we never got on. Like we got on some underground Christian radio stuff, but we never had radio success. And so he didn't. The only thing he understood is if you turn on your car and and there's music playing, then those people are made it. Right. Right. But the, anything I'm doing, what in the world is it? Who buys it? What is it? What does it mean? Are you make money doing that? He, he, he never understood that. But watching TV and seeing my song play in the background, he literally at that moment went, I guess Toby is legit. <laughs> <laughs> Time runs Well, look, I mean, this whole decision to like start a band and coming from where y'all come from and at the uh, speed in which you were exposed to these things, I, I think it's crazy that this band happened uh, and then even furthermore got so big as it did. Uh, and, I mean, you're still a band that is has figured out a sustainable uh, model for a long-term career, like right. pioneering even in some ways, you know, starting your own record label, doing all this stuff. Um, so it life-changing like deciding to move to seattle and do this changed everybody's life forever and uh changed you guys individually it exposed you to the whole world i mean how does that make you feel what kind of person do you think you would have been without it like where would your life have gone or uh, you know how do you how do you see this really impacting your life i'd be a sad potentially racist teacher. <laughs> but because of this band, I was able to experience outside of the the wealth of lack of knowledge. There's a wealth of no knowledge from where, where I came from. Well, and people no, where y'all are from have not been to Europe. Right. Or South America no, no, or no. Australia my, or The farthest my, bed, my dad has ever been is Atlanta. Alabama. <laughs> my dad has flown in an airplane one time to Alabama. Yeah. And he, t he still talks about it. So nobody understands. There is no, I mean, it, it really was a lack of culture and understanding and education there, that didn't exist. Like you were supposed to get a job after high school and move on, get ki have kids, 
you know, raise a family, that's it. And you stay in your town. And so I really do believe, like, because of this band, I was able to expand my mind and, and, and realize that there's way more to this world and this life than I ever dreamed of. And I, I would even say this. Here's what I think. Like, because of, of the music industry, we were able to actually learn more about life like it, it wasn't just us i mean there was a, like we were talking earlier there's other bands that did it like beloved or hopes fall or norma jean uh between the buried and me was from north carolina yeah like there, there are all these bands that just said i'm going to go against the grain when we saw other bands trying to do stuff it encouraged us as well and we thought what if and that's really where we were we were just like what if we tried we didn't think success. We thought, what if we tried yeah, that's as and as goes, and yeah. could see what could happen? And then it just it did work out. Like because we tried, because we believed in ourselves a little bit and put a little bit of time and effort and money behind ourselves, we were able to be where we're at right now. Otherwise, yeah, I, I think I would have. I, I believe I would have stayed in Greer, be way more close minded and way less open to new ideas, at all. I thought you'd succeed because everybody had their mind together on it. And uh, except Toby, he ain't got much of a mind. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, I, I thought you would do good. I didn't think that you would probably make it a career out on the West Coast. I knew you had your mind made up to do something with your music. And you, you all really had a lot of talent in the group. And I, it didn't surprise me that you all uh, were successful. You know, I don't want to sound too uh, sappy or anything, but I am real proud of what all y'all have done. And y'all did a lot with what you had to go with, but you had a lot of talent and had a lot of ambition. I've been very proud of all of you. Emery has broken the mold in so many ways. They were late bloomers from the Bible Belt who were slated to a life of sameness and conformity, but somehow managed, almost accidentally, to create an amazing life for themselves, enrich the lives of hundreds of thousands of fans through their music, and changed the Christian music scene forever. And they did all of this not by chasing some crazy dream, but simply by doing the things that they loved every single day. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not, but there is an entire book written on Emory by Aaron Lunsford, who is the world's authority on it. He spent years and years traveling, touring, and tour managing with us, and he spent the last couple of years collecting and writing a book about all the ins and outs and uh, idiosyncrasies and nuances of what Emory's like inside and out. And if you're interested in that at all, you can go to emorybook.com. It's available for pre-order right now, and you can get some chapters right away. So again, that's emorybook.com if you're interested in that. Thanks again for listening to the Labeled Podcast. I'm Matt Carter, along with Toby Morrell and Aaron Lunsford. This show is produced and edited by Melanie Studley and mixed by Brett Baird. Special thanks to our assistant producers, Reva Hansen, Marshall Fremuth, and Tyson Paletti. An extra special thanks to Adam Scatula from Tooth & Nail for helping to develop the show. See you soon. Now I am proud.